Welcome back fellow aircraft builders and aviation enthusiasts. Today's video is the start of my open-ended basic drafting series, which is all about manual drafting techniques and concepts. It's my hope that this series will help new builders quickly get started laying out parts directly onto raw materials to then be cut out and formed into shape. In future videos, I'll cover reading blueprints, maintaining accuracy, and other tips to help you produce your parts. In this video though, we'll be talking about drafting theory and taking a look at the tools and precision instruments needed to get started. There's a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get into it. Okay, let's get the talking head stuff out of the way with a little bit about drafting theory. For whatever reason, many builders in the planning stages of their projects start thinking about whether it's beneficial to reproduce blueprint drawings with a computer-aided design or CAD program, and whether you should use computer numeric controlled or CNC equipment to produce parts. I've spoken to a number of professional CAD designers, and it's generally agreed that you will not save any time by redrawing the airplane in CAD to make traceable templates or produce parts on CNC equipment. This is true even if you are already skilled in CAD and CNC. To do so means you would spend a lot of time on planning, drawing, calibrating, machine setup, and other tasks before you make a single part. I'll further argue that you will not likely realize any meaningful benefit in the finished product if you're only building one copy of an airplane. I know I'm going to catch some criticism for that last statement, but bear with me. My opinions on this subject are geared towards someone who does not have much experience in drawing things in CAD, producing things on CNC, and who does not have easy access to this kind of machinery. If you're already skilled in CAD design and have access to CNC equipment to produce your parts, then you simply may be most comfortable building your project that way. But for the rest of us, it certainly isn't necessary, and we would likely get bogged down with all the side projects involved. There is a fairly common misconception that CAD and CNC produced parts are somehow better or necessary to build an airworthy airplane. After all, most modern aircraft are produced that way. However, the Zenith Stoll CH750 that I'm building is the direct descendant of the CH701, which was designed to be built from scratch, by hand, with no computerized equipment. Remember, we are not building combat aircraft or airliners. Home-built aircraft airframes do not require the level of precision and accuracy that CNC equipment produces. Zenith uses CNC manufacturing equipment for their kits so they can provide parts with match drilled holes and lots of consistency for high volume production runs. However, in Zenith's construction manual for scratch builders, you only need to achieve the kind of accuracy and consistency that's fairly easy to accomplish with basic tools. Generally speaking, as long as you're not undersizing your parts and mating parts have matching dimensions, you've done your job. This is not difficult to accomplish with manual drafting methods and homemade tooling. Prior to the late 1980s and early 1990s, most aircraft kits were just bundles of raw materials with a few of the more difficult parts made for you. Almost all home-built aircraft were essentially scratch-built using non-computerized methods. Only during the last 10 to 15 years have the kit manufacturers been offering more complete kits with preformed parts manufactured on CNC equipment. If you choose to redraw the airplane in CAD, more power to you. It could be that building a DIY CNC router table to make your part blanks is just the kind of intellectual exercise you want to explore. But it is very easy to get distracted from your main goal of building an airplane with side projects like a CNC router table and learning CAD. The point of this series is to highlight that you can successfully lay out these parts using good old-fashioned manual drafting methods, just like scores of engineering professionals did prior to the widespread adoption of computerized manufacturing processes. Zenith airplanes are very simple machines, mechanically speaking. The technological complexity is in their design, and Zenith has already done that part for us. We only need to follow proven manual construction and assembly methods to build one of their airplanes. The techniques I outline in this series are very basic drafting tips and tricks that I learned many years ago. I had roughly five years of instruction in manual drafting and CAD design in both high school and at the university level before I changed majors and went into government service. Oh, how I kick myself every day for having made that change. Anyway, I'm certainly no expert or engineer, but Zenith has blessed us with simple blueprints to build simple airplanes. This means that basic drafting techniques are all that's required of us, and an average Joe like me can build an airplane at home without fancy equipment. I fabricated the parts in this airplane using nothing but manual drafting methods, and they've all turned out according to the specifications set forth by Zenith. Sure, I've had to remake a few parts here and there, but that has nothing to do with manual drafting techniques. 
However, you will have to decide if the techniques I present in this series will help you produce acceptable parts. The parts examples in this series will be taken from the Zenith Stoll CH750 Edition 3 blueprints, but the drafting concepts are applicable to just about any scratch-built airplane. One quick note, I will not be doing a rudder build video. Homebuilthelp.com has already done that in their Scratch Building Basics DVD, and I highly recommend getting a copy of it. That video covers different things than I do, and I encourage you to review all the different perspectives and instructional materials out there. All right, enough of my talking head. Let's take a look at the drafting tools and instruments we need to start laying out parts. Okay, so we're over here at the assembly table, and I've laid out a selection of drafting tools and measuring tools and layout tools. And there's a lot of overlap between them for different various purposes throughout the build process, but essentially you have two categories of drafting that you're going to be doing. One is going to be laying stuff out onto the material itself. The other one is either going to be laying stuff out on a paper or cardboard template, or uh, laying stuff out on wood to create form blocks or cutting templates. So what I'm going to start with here is the selection of writing instruments. Uh, so that's going to be your pens, pencils, markers, and, and etc. Now for marking on aluminum, you don't want to use any pencil lead. You want to use either grease pencils or color pencils or what I like to use are Sharpie type markers. These things work great on aluminum. It's easy to clean the aluminum off. If you need to start over or make a mistake, you just wipe it off with some uh, rubbing alcohol or something like that. It cleans right up. It's very, very nice to use. Anything that's based on lead, like here, these pencils down here, these are going to be useful for drawing on wood or drawing on paper or cardboard. You don't want to use lead on aluminum because it introduces graphite into the aluminum and that is a potential for corrosion that is very hard to remedy from drafting with uh, graphite type uh, materials. So uh, very quickly, I'll talk about drafting with pencils. So you can see here I've got basically your average schoolhouse type pencil. This is actually a drafting pencil that does not come with an eraser, but it does have a, your typical sharpened, typical lead that you would sharpen, and it sharpens down to a point with a conical shape. Now this is fine for light drafting work, and you can use it on wood and everything else, but the rougher the surface, the quicker that lead is going to wear down. And because it's conical in shape, rather than what a lead holder or mechanical pencil lead is like, the width of the drawing line that you're, that you're going to be using, as this pencil gets more and more worn down, the line that you draw gets wider and wider. Now, generally, that's not a huge deal because it's not that wide to begin with, but uh, if you want to, you want to avoid that as best as you can. So here's a mechanical pencil, and you can use any kind of mechanical pencil. I prefer um, mechanical pencils with 0.5 leads, and uh, they work very well for drafting, and I've drafted for years and years and years with this type of mechanical pencil. Lead itself stays the same diameter no matter how worn down it gets, and then you just advance the lead out by clicking it or in some twist as well. But generally, you're going to find a way to advance the lead some way uh, to you know, keep um, drafting with it and they do wear down very quickly when you're drafting on plywood and things like that but they're they're quite useful on paper and everything else but this is my preferred method because the size of the line does not change the more you draw with it and that becomes important when we talk about accuracy and consistency later on and I'm going to demonstrate those issues later on in future videos when we actually get to drawing some parts but mechanical pencil would be my preference doesn't matter which brand doesn't matter which kind doesn't even matter which lead width that you choose, but um, I prefer 0.5 or 0.7 for most applications. That's what you're going to use on paper, wood, other hard surfaces and things like that. Just don't use this on aluminum. So for drawing on aluminum, my preference is for Sharpie brand markers. I, I'm not trying to plug Sharpie. I don't get any kickback from them for this, but my preference is for Sharpie. And just like using a mechanical pencil, you can see here I've got this Sharpie Ultra Fine point. And this is very similar to a mechanical pencil in the fact that the uh, very tip of it, if it wears down, and they will wear down quickly when you're using them on aluminum, when they wear down, the diameter of the felt doesn't change as you keep drawing. And that's with the ultra fine point Sharpie marker here. I prefer blue for most layout applications, but I also use multiple colors for things like labeling parts, drawing attention to certain features on parts and things like that. Like if I want to specify which rivets to use in a certain area, I may mark it in red. And these fine point markers that have the 
pointed tips on them, those are fine for, for labeling and things like that, but you don't want to draw with these, again, because as this wears down, and it will wear down very quickly, uh, the width of the line changes drastically, especially on these markers, even much more so over a pencil. So I recommend having a few colors of these just for highlighting different features of different things. This becomes especially important on things like when you're making your wing spars and stuff like that. You have lots of different types of rivets. You're going to be setting lots of different um, locations that you want to call attention to. You may be put writing assembly notes on the parts and these different color markers. Um, you can actually categorize those types of things with, with a color and it makes it very consistent from assembly to assembly depending on what you're trying to denote on the drawing. And the other thing I want to call your attention to here is this is an edge distance marker, and, uh, or a marking block rather, and it's adjustable right here. This is adjustable depending on what, uh, what you want to do. This is extremely useful for marking edge distance on things like flanges. So if you're tracing around a form block or a cutting block to make a template, you can set this so when it marks the distance from wherever you're uh, measuring from, you get a nice consistent uh, spacing on everything and, and you'll you'll find this very handy on all sorts of applications uh, throughout manufacturing your parts and such and uh, you can make one of these you can make a, a simpler version of this out of some tubing and some Delrin or a wood block or anything but they're not that expensive to buy either I think they're 12 or 13 dollars to buy one and then uh, you just have to add your own marking device so uh, highly recommend an ed edge distance marker block Okay, so that's pretty much it for drafting uh, utensils as far as uh, markers and pens and pencils are concerned. I'm going to reposition the camera slightly and draw your attention to drafting triangles, which are what I consider the bread and butter of being able to lay out parts. So we'll be right back. So these two uh, triangles are a set of standard drafting triangles in the 8-inch, roughly 8-inch size. I think the 30-60-90 triangle on the right is a 10-inch triangle, but this is an 8-inch triangle. These are a standard size drafting triangle that you would use if you had a drafting board. I've outlined them in red just so you can see them clearly against the background here. They don't normally come this way. And these are extremely important for laying out parts. If you've ever watched any old school drafting videos of old guys in white shirts and black skinny ties, at drafting boards like old war movies and stuff. These are the types of drafting triangles that they would be using. And these are my old drafting triangles from high school. I've had them since ninth grade. I actually have a couple different sets of them, but I've had them for many, many years. But they are extremely good quality. These are made by a company called Service Reproduction Company here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, um, these are pretty much industry standard triangles. Now you can get these from all sorts of different companies. You can get them online from Amazon or whatever, but you want drafting quality precision triangles. They, they only run four or five dollars a piece so it's not a huge investment and it's well worth the money. So a two standard drafting triangles you're going to have a 45 degree triangle and then a 30 60 90. For our project you don't need these two sizes you could certainly have two 30 60 90s you could have two 45s you could have any combination thereof that you want. I highly recommend the eight uh, inch size minimum. Uh, for our purposes this is about the right size for the smaller parts that we're going to lay out and these work really well. Another thing that I want to point out about drafting triangles is that it's very important that you have a, a known square reference for calibrating your other tools. And generally speaking, if I was going to bet on any one of these tools on, that I'm going to show you here on the table that one of them was square, it's going to be one of the drafting triangles. And that's important because you want to make sure that all your other tools are square with it and so you can, you can reference them against the drafting triangles and see if the tool itself is actually square or not. Now, there are all kinds of different squares and tools that we're going to use. I mean, you can use a speed square, a rafter square, a framing square, anything like that, but this is going to tell you whether or not it's actually square. I even use things like machinists squares on my smaller equipment and things like that, and I check everything against the drafting triangle to make sure that if it, it's square. If it doesn't fit up square against the drafting triangle, I discard it and get another one. And furthermore, one additional use is with the protractor. Now this is a common, cheap, you know, machinist type or shop type protractor. It's not the same thing as a drafting protractor, but this is what you're going to use laying out most of your parts and checking your angles and things like that. This is a very cheap brand. Uh, I think I paid not even $10 for this one. I think I got it on Amazon. It's a general tools or something like that. But generally speaking, the, if you look at the, 
the scale itself is going to be pretty accurate in terms of the degrees and everything like that. However, there's a hash mark up here that marks, uh, it's a measurement line to where you set the degree at, and it's supposed to be the center line of where this uh, nut is. So when this thing pivots around here, it's the very, it's, it should be directly in line with how this thing pivots. And sure enough, when I got mine, it was off by a few degrees. And the only reason I knew that was because I checked the 90 degree setting on the protractor against my drafting triangles. And sure enough, it was off. What I did is I actually filed off the scribe line on this and then put a new one on after re recalibrating it to 90 degrees using the drafting triangle. And now this is very accurate and you can check it at different places. You can check it against the 45 degree, you can check it against the 30, 60, 90, and, and at various points and they should all be, once you've calibrated it to the proper 90 degrees, they should all be in line if the scale itself is accurate. And like I said, more than likely the dial is accurate, it's just that where they marked the scribe line in relation to the pivot point probably is not. So you'll want to check those things out. All right, so we're going to move the camera and talk about measuring devices and a few other things. So we'll be right back after that. Okay, so besides the drafting triangles and then your, your inking or drawing devices, like your pens and pencils, probably the next most important thing is going to be a steel rule, um, a ruler of some kind or a steel scale of some kind that obviously has metric available on it. And this one is uh, Empire brand, and it has inch measurements on the top and metric on the bottom, and it's an 18 inch or 500 millimeter uh, steel rule. I have used this for almost all of my measurements that weren't over this length. And then I've used a Stanley Power Lock metric tape that also has inch and, me and metric on it as well. And kind of like with the drafting triangles and the protractor, you want to make sure that your scale that your drafting scale or your tape measure scale is consistent with the measurements on the steel rule. So let me zoom in a little bit here. So what you want to do is, is with any measuring tools, if you buy a Lufkin, which is what uh, Zenith sells, or you, or you order something on Amazon, or run down to your local hardware store and find something in metric. Metric in the United States is a little bit harder to find. And uh, I think I ordered these all online, although this is a Stanley that I ordered, I think, from Sears, possibly. But um, the Empire I got from Amazon as well. And anything that you actually use for measurement, now this isn't just to draw lines with, this is if you're actually using to locate measurements, you want to make sure that everything's calibrated properly. So you're going to want to note the zero point on the metric scale that is your primary scale, which in my case is this one, and measure it against the metric scale on the tape measure you'll find that there probably is going to be some discrepancy that will get worse and worse and worse the farther down from zero that you go, but it should be very minimal um, in order for you to consider using it. And furthermore, if there is a big discrepancy, you'll want to take note of what that is and then compensate for it in the drawings. So for example, if I measure 100 millimeters on the Empire scale, I want to make sure that I'm measuring 100 millimeters on the Stanley tape measure. Now, don't just check it over you know, 100 millimeters because that's a short distance and similar to a previous video I did on the rivet fan, it may be very difficult to tell how far you're off after 100 millimeters, but when you get out to 400 or 500 millimeters, it's a, it's a bigger discrepancy. So make sure that you measure across a good span to determine how much uh, error correction, if any, that you have to do. Things to keep in mind, but you definitely are going to need some kind of a steel scale. Also, if you use this as a cutting guide for small components, perhaps you clamp this down and use an Olfa knife to score your components. Don't cut against the measure side, cut against the non-measure sides. Okay, so a few other tool options that you have. Uh, a combination square like this works really well for laying parts out on aluminum, especially if you have a square edge to reference this against. I've also used the uh, rafter square as well. And again, checked all these for square against my uh, drafting triangles. These work really well. When you're drawing curved surfaces and things like that, there's a traditional method in old school drafting to use what's called an irregular curve or a French curve. And I have a couple of these, but uh, these are kind of a pain in the neck to use over large distances if you don't have a ton of coordinates to base your lines off of. So I don't really use this uh, at all as far as during building the airplane. Uh, what I've switched to is a flexible straight edge, which is an oxymoron. That's a contradiction in terms, but it's a flexible edge. 
It even has a scale built into it. It has both inch and metric measurements built into it. It works quite well, essentially when you're laying stuff out in coordinates, and I'll demonstrate this in future videos, you're laying out coordinates uh, for like wing ribs or wing profiles or say a nose rib, like if this was my nose rib profile, the drawings are going to give you lots of different coordinates and points, and then you just connect the dots with the flexible edge, and that gives you your nice sweeping curve. And it's very flexible. You can, you can shape it any way you want to. You can pinch it right down. Works very well to do that. So that's my number one recommendation. Basically, it's a flexible straight edge or a flexible drawing edge. <clears throat> Next up, we have the typical drafting protractor here and I don't know that I've ever actually used this in the plane build at all. This is something that I don't think is necessary but um, if, you're, if you're laying out a lot of things by angle on paper or cardboard or wood this can come in handy but like I said I normally just use my machinist protractor or shop protractor instead and it does the same job. But you may find these are cheap enough that you may find just having one handy gives you a hand with things. One of the things about Zenith's blueprints is that they don't, they don't lay things out drawing-wise by angles, except for when you're checking bend angles. So all of the points on a part itself, the cutting out the part blank and everything, those are all typically located by coordinate measurement or reference lines and things like that. They don't use a lot of angles to, to show you you know, like if you're cutting off the corner of a piece of material, they don't use an angle to tell you that. They just locate up the two points by measurement and you strike your line that way. So that's why this isn't terribly useful as far as drawing parts. Down here we have two sets of, uh, or two machinist squares. Again, these were checked against my drafting triangles and they're accurate. I found these uh, just cheap ones on Amazon. And uh, they're useful for making sure that your drill press is perfectly perpendicular to the workpiece making sure other tools are square, bandsaw blades, things like that, and anything that has some adjustable uh, angle to it, you can rapidly square things up with these. It's mostly useful on things like the metal cutting bandsaw and the drill press and just rapid uh, layout of parts on metal stock small for small heavy pieces. All right, I'm gonna reposition the camera yet again. So I apologize for the kind of somewhat weird angle, um, but I have a set of, these are just cheap Harbor Freight dial calipers, and I also have an inexpensive um, micrometer that goes down to 10 thousandths of an inch. And these are useful for determining thicknesses of material if you've cleaned away or scoured away all of the measurements on there. They're pretty useful for finding those things out. They're also useful for determining if things are in specification and stuff like that. And for the modest price, I recommend having a set of each of those on hand just for um, materials measurements and things like that. So uh, up, up, up top up here, up here, this is a modular straight edge and I forget the brand name of it, but you can buy these in eight foot sections. And you'll see over to the right here, there's a little connecting tab and it slides into the top one there and then tightens down with screws and that gives you, they're each four feet long and that gives you an eight foot modular straight edge. Now I actually have two sets of those because I needed a 12 foot straight edge to do the wing skins and the wing spars. So that, those things make a very handy clampable cutting guide to use when you're making very, very long precision cuts. And they're very flexible so you have to clamp in multiple locations and you can check out my wing spar cutting videos uh, to see how I've used those. Up above that is just a standard 48 inch, I think it's a Pittsburgh, which is a Harbor Freight brand, 48 inch ruler, steel ruler or straight edge. And then above that is a 54 inch drywall square. Now those are mainly just used for clamping and cutting against. I don't really use those for measurements at all. And they're just useful for using with the Ulfa knife when you're cutting out aluminum sheets. The one thing I'll note, you want to use care if you're doing, if you're using those for parts layout, you want to be very careful with the drywall square over here in the corner. There's a lot of flex in that material side to side if you're trying to use it as an accurate square. And so typically if you're laying out a very long uh, wing skin or something across four feet or five feet area and you're referencing it with the edge of the square, you want to ensure by measurements that the tip of the square of the square edge over there of the of the drywall square hasn't drifted back and forth you'll get several millimeters of drift back and forth compared to the root down here of the drywall square if that makes sense 
So there's a few more tools here that we want to talk about. First thing is the rivet fan, and this is a 10-hole rivet fan. This uh, is basically how you're going to want to lay out all the spacing on your rivets, and I've demonstrated how to use this tool in other videos. But basically this is an accordion-style tool that maintains an equidistant space between all these little rivet holes, um, no matter what you set your pitch at. So if, if the plans call for a 40 millimeter pitch, that would be pitch 40 in the plans, you'd measure 40 millimeters between all these holes, and they all stay the same distance. So if you set one of them at 40, the rest of them are going to be at 40, and then this would be how you'd lay out and mark with your marker in each one of these holes how to lay out 40 millimeters of pitch for your rivet holes. And, and you can adjust to, you know, if, if 40 millimeter pitch doesn't fit quite perfectly between two points, you can always shrink it down uh, to maintain equal spacing, which is basically just a visual improvement. It's cosmetic generally. You just don't want to stretch it out further when you're laying out the rivets. So be sure to check out my video on how to use this tool properly before you do that. But this is called a rivet fan or a rivet spacing guide, and it's pretty much a must-have for a scratch builder because we have to drill all of our own rivet holes. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about are basically drawing or cutting circles, holes and circles. Generally speaking, from a drafting perspective, you've got a precision drafting compass, and I do highly recommend getting one of these. You're basically going to need one to, to make some of the tools and make some of the circles that you have to cut. It's my recommendation that you get one that adjusts with a thumb wheel. If you use one that just uses a friction mechanism, it's very easy to bump the measurement off when you're transferring it or when you're laying out your scale against the measurement and then you go to draw it on the, the part or whatever. It's very easy to be uh, make a, um, a very small adjustment inadvertently while you're moving it around, whereas the thumb wheel adjustable ones uh, pretty much stay locked in place until you rotate the wheel. But these are basically, this is the standard tool used to draw larger circles. And you have a couple of options with that, but mainly the big thing I want to point out to you is that these are typically lead-based devices. So up here you have a sharp pin or needle basically that sticks out and that, that jams into the paper or the, or the cardboard or the material to lock the, uh, this leg of the compass in place. And then you have a lead that draws the circle around it. You basically twist it around a circle like that and it will, it will draw your circle like that. So the problem with this one, of course, is that it has lead, so you don't want to use it on aluminum. However, you still need to make large sweeping radiuses and diameters on your aluminum stock. So there's two ways to combat this. One is to purchase a set of, of circle templates for, you know, draftsmen use these, and these are ones I've had since high school again. But um, the problem is, is that you have to ensure that they are perfectly accurate. Now, you don't need to draw things like bolt holes and things like that to scale. You can just make a circle around your location point and then write in that it needs to be a quarter inch hole or a three eighths inch hole or whatever. But in terms of actually drawing radiuses around things, if you're actually going to be cutting metal in a specific radius or you're going to have a round over point or you have a fillet in a certain place, uh, then circle templates are very helpful for that. But again, just like with main, making sure that your parts are square and your tools are square, you want to ensure that any circle templates you're using are accurate. And so, for example, this here is a two inch hole on this circle template. You want to measure across that hole and make sure that it is in fact two inches across the hole. And this one is accurate as well as this template. Any hole that I use on these templates, I measure first to make sure that they're accurate and then I go ahead and use them and you can see the marker lines on these holes. So these templates are accurate. However, I have a set of metric templates that aren't even remotely accurate. So uh, I didn't realize that until later in the build. It turns out it didn't matter as much as I thought it was going to where I used those, but I stopped using them after a while. The other problem is that there are going to be certain radiuses and diameters that are simply too large to use with a circle template. And so you basically have to make your own. And I make lots of different size templates. This is 1 8 inch hard cardboard or press board cardboard that comes shipped with my uh, thicker sheets of aluminum that I ordered from Alro Steel. They use this as a protective layer and it's one basically 1 8 inch thick press board. And it's marvelous stuff to use to make um, circle templates with and other types of templates. So you can see here I've got one that's uh, basically 25 millimeter radius. I've got one here that's a radius of 47.3 47 millimeters. I've got one here that's a radius of 115 millimeters. And I'm actually going to have a separate video showing you precisely how I make these from start to finish. And then, so I use the, <clears throat> I use the compass to draw these out onto the cardboard 
And then depending on how large of one I need, like this one here is only, you know, a 90 degree sweep um, or a quarter of a circle. Uh, depending on how large of one, I might cut a whole circle out or I might, you know, just cut a part of a circle out depending on how big of a curve I need. But I cut these out generally on my bandsaw and then just finish them off on the belt sander. And these are marvelous for any time you have a real radius. For irregular curves and things like that, that's what the flexible straight edge is for. But anything where you have a standard radius measurement, these circle templates are great. And there are plenty of places in the, in the airplane where you need something like this. Alternatively, you can take a thin strip of, of aluminum, lay out a measurement on it, and use that. You can drill a small hole for an anchor hole and then a small hole for your marker. And you can use that as a basically a uh, circle maker on a large scale. And there have been a couple places where I've done that as well. But I don't, I don't remember where I put my last one. But So you can just take a thin strip of metal, lay out a straight line on it, mark two points for the diameter or, um, or rather the radius of the curve that you need to make, drill two holes, one for an anchor point and one for your Sharpie marker, and then you can, you can anchor one side of it down and then draw your curve sliding this thing along the material as you go. So at any rate, that's basically it for the drafting tools. So I'll leave links to a bunch of selections down uh, in the description below on these things. And um, hopefully this video will be useful to you. And in future videos, we're actually going to be drawing parts and making cutting templates and other things like that, all part of this drafting series. So thanks for watching. For more information about the Zenith Stull CH750, please visit Zenith Aircraft Company online at www.zenithair.net. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Be sure to click on the notification bell to receive all the channel updates. For additional information on the project, check out my blog at gregsplane.blogspot.com. You can also contact me directly at gregsstollch750 at gmail.com. As always, thanks for watching and good luck with your projects.